Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Optimizing Immunopeptide Analysis Sample Preparation in Needle Biopsy Size Tissue Samples with AFA Technology. I am Megan Pasquale of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Covaris. To learn more, visit covaris.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you're having trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speakers. Nicholas Autret, PhD, Senior Business Development, Manager, Covaris, and Marco Tugnetti, PhD, Principal Scientist, Diagnosis. Nicholas and Marco, you may now begin your presentation. Thank you, Megan. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Nicholas from Covaris, and I will uh, introduce today the concept of adaptive focused acoustics. And this will be followed by the main presentation by Marco about the use of uh, this technology to prepare sample for immunopeptidomics. So I've been working at Covaris for more than four years now, and I've been meeting a lot of customers in the field of prodomic sample prep. And uh, we found with those discussions that Covar um, researchers have a lot of uh, challenges in common. And the first one is reproducibility. And this reproducibility is caused by many steps that have variations during the process. The second um, uh, challenge they have is how to automate the uh, sample prep process and how to get it standardized and normalized. And this also has a lot of impacts about reliability of the data and the turnaround time. We are also seeing more and more people wanting to get more out of less and uh, trying to decrease the sample input. And this is also important because um, during the processing, sample can be uh, lost due, for instance, to surface adsorption. And last but not least, and I believe you will uh, have a nice video at the end of this talk, throughput is also becoming a, a key step and uh, people want to increase the speed, increase the throughput, and of course, they want to have an efficient process in place. And because samples deserve the best treatment, we wanted to, to bring AFA to you today. And uh, I'd like to say that we are really uh, specialized in pre-analytical sample prep instrumentation. We have a main technology named AFA or Adaptive Focused Acoustics, and we also have a way to prepare more complex or, or more important samples, but I will focus today on adaptive focused acoustics, which key differentiators are first the ability to really focus the energy that is delivered to the sample and also ensure a thermal control so that the sample integrity is preserved during the process. It's a non-contact approach and it's available in a lot of formats so that it can basically work from one cell up to milligrams or even grams of tissue. As I said, the first objective of reproducibility uh, of health structures is reproducibility. And one key advantage of adaptive focused acoustics is that it really process the heart of the sample without any damage to the sample. And this is because uh, creating cavitation through the syndication process generates heat. And we have a way to instantaneously dissipate that heat so that the sample remains at the same temperature during the process. And unlike other technologies based also on sonication, like probe sonication or water bath sonication, we really work in a, a concentrated zone of one to three millimeter. And as a consequence, you will create heat to the sample that is uh, creating that variability between samples. Also, to my knowledge, we are the only technology able to process at the same time one to 384 samples and as such we are the only technology able to guarantee this parallel and consistent treatment between samples. One of the first uh, uh, workflows that was uh, designed with Covaris was based on the work by Jeroen Kreisfeld with the SP3 approach. SP3 stands for single pot 
solid phase sample preparation. And in a paper released early 2020, Jeroen Kreisfeld and Thorsten Müller described an auto SP3 approach which allows to do a single pot treatment of samples from the dispensing into our plates down to the uh, mass spec injection. As you can see here on the slide, you can dispense the sample in our plate, process in the covaris, where you can do different steps, like, of course, lysis, DNA shearing. In some cases, when working with FFP, you can even remove paraffin without any uh, solvent. And after that, you can go into this SP3 process where you bind protein to the beads and you ensure with washing that you remove any contaminant, whether it comes from the buffer or the paraffin itself. And after that, you can do trypsin digestion and directly inject if you like, or you can also have an additional cleanup if uh, uh, needed. We've worked with a, a lot of lab in the past years, and we've reached now more than 200 publications about sample prep. And this also allowed us to release different application notes. You will be able to find uh, the uh, links uh, in, in the next uh, slides. And we have been also able to work with some customers to release new products like this 384 well plate that I mentioned before. We developed with customers uh, new applications. I mentioned this lysis and uh, paraffin removal. And with Jessica Chapman working at MSK in New York, uh, we also developed ways to process digestion under three hours with adaptive focused acoustics. And there is a video available on our website if you want to learn more. We also worked with a group of Jenny Van Eyck at Cedar Sinai in Los Angeles with uh, lower inputs to uh, uh, elucidate the role of drug perturbation in different cell cultures. And there is also a video available for this. We worked with single cells. You will learn today about immunopeptidomics. And we also worked on co-extraction workflows. And we have more and more requests about the co-extraction, for instance, of RNA and proteins. But also, we have requests to work with buffers that do not need to be removed, like ammonium bicarbonate. And as such, we are working on new non-SDS-based workflows so that customer can even reduce the number of steps during the workflow. We have a lot of documentation available on our website, and many of this documentation has been revised recently. So you really have uh, the up-to-date information about the possibility offered by adaptive focused acoustics. And because of this hard work, we really believe that your samples deserve the best treatment and that this best treatment is coverage uh, acoustics. Now it's time to me to thank you for your attention and hand over to Marco. Thanks a lot, Nicolas. Uh, I'm actually very excited to have the opportunity to talk to you about how we actually apply AFA technology uh, to optimize and improve our immunopeptidomics pipeline. The immune system is a layer defense system with increasing specificity. The first layer of defense is the innate immunity, which has physical components such as, as the skin, chemical and cellular components. And these target pathogens or would like pathogens in a non-specific manner. If this is not enough and the pathogen manages to develop and invade the host, the adaptive immune system kicks in and generates an antigen-specific cellular response that very efficiently clears the pathogen. But how is this antigen specificity ensured? It is ensured through the self non-self recognition made by T cells. And this happens molecularly at the level of the T cell receptor, here depicted in green, that recognizes an antigen or MHC, MHC associated peptide, here represented in blue, or also known as immunopeptide, that it's bound by MHC molecule, which in humans, it's called HLA. So MHC is the term for vertebrates, HLA is for humans. And this interestingly comes from the most polymorphic gene cluster in the human genome. It's hypomorphic, 
we have more than 17,000 allelic forms reported to date. And what is fascinating about this is that each of these forms alters the structure and the specificity of this MHC molecule. So we see here the binding cleft of uh, MHC class one molecule, more about that later. Uh, and we see that this binding pocket is very tight. And we can imagine that different amino acids on the MHC level here will have an effect on which peptide is preferentially bound in this pocket. And so different allotypes, so different allelic form of HLA molecules, will change the spectrum of peptides that are presented by, the, the, by cells to the immune system. An important thing is that if a peptide binds a HLA molecule, it does not mean you will have an immune response because this is then the T cell receptor recognizing it in a immune activating environment that will lead to immune response. And importantly, we have two classes. So class one is presented by all nucleate cells and cells that don't express any class one are targeted for killing. It presents its antigens to cytotoxic T cells and each cell in our body can present to up to six different allotypes of HLA class one molecules. This already shows the variability and large spectrum of peptides that can be bound and presented by HLA molecules. And it plays a very important role in the cell mediated response because it presents the antigen to cytotoxic T cells that then decide whether or not to kill the cell. And the peptide growth of this molecule, it's very defined so that peptides bound to this class one HLA are usually nine amino acid in length with little variability there. Class two, on the other hand, it's presented only on immune cells. And this makes um, the presentation of the antigen to T helper cells, which then orchestrate the immune response. Each single cell can present up to 16 different allotypes of class two HLA molecules. And it plays a very important role in the humoral response, so activation of B cells and antibody production. This binding groove is actually open on the side, so it looks more kind of a hot dog. And so the length of these peptides, it's much more variable. So the immunopeptides are the key player of the antigen specific immune response. But what are the application fields where immunopeptides could help? Actually, any disease susceptibility study, because you want to understand what is there in your target or understand what happens there. It plays an important role in autoimmune diseases as well as graft versus host diseases. And here of particular interest is the prediction or uh, looking at what if a gene therapy will then generate immunopeptide and antigens to which we will then have an immune response. So it's very important to understand how gene therapy affects the immune system. And then of course, a very hot topic is the personalized cancer immunotherapies. Here we have to distinguish between neoepitopes. So these are antigens that come from two more specific mutations. So they will be not found on healthy samples or two more associated antigens where these can be found in the healthy samples or healthy tissue, but are much higher in intensity, so much more presented on tumor, specific, uh, on tumor tissue. And also it can be very helpful in helping designing treatment method might be vaccines or cell-based therapies. So overall, in the key of the specific immune response, understanding them has the potential to lock on unlock this powerful machine at will, depending on whether you want more or less immune responses. However, there are many challenges linked to it, and that's why immunopeptidomic has been a growing field, but uh, plagued with some high challenges. The first one is it usually requires very large sample input amounts in the range of grams. Since they bind to a specific molecule, it's known that these peptides are actually limited in the physical chemical variability they present because they have to bind to this protein first. Also, they tend to 
poorly ionized because they don't have the classic basic amino acids that leads to good ionization as well as a nice Y-ion fragment ser series. So the fragmentation pattern of these peptides is non-conventional, which results in information poor MS2 spectra, making it much harder to identify peptides and uh, being confident in their identification. And finally, something that until a couple of years ago was kind of daunting and impossible is the fact that the search space that we generate there is humongous because you don't have any specificity. So you have to look for any possible peptide uh, in your database. That's why we came up with a solution that we call the True Discovery Immunopeptidomics. Here we start with either cells or tissues. An important step is the native lysis, and this is where we use adaptive focus acoustics because it's very important that the cells are lysed and we generate this emulsion in under native conditions because the next step is a magnetic immunoprecipitation. Here we use antibodies that recognize specific classes, so to say, of HLA molecules, for example, class one, tentai class one HLA molecules, and pull them down. So it's important that the samples are um, native and the proteins maintain the conformation they, they have in cells. Here we use magnetic beads so that we can really have a highly automated pipeline. We can use 96 wells, both for the lysis as well as then for the immunoprecipitation. We then separate the peptides from the HLA molecules, which we then shoot on to our LCMSMS. Here we use state-of-the-art machine technology. For example, we use FAMES, ion mobility-based separation in order to generate an extra layer of separation and increasing our uh, confidence in our identifications. We are co-inventors of DIA, Data Independent Acquisition, and this is also why we then invested here on optimizing this DIA method specifically for immunopeptinomics as well as DDA method that is data dependent acquisition. And we found that both optimized methods work really well, uh, but DIA has a sensitivity in the range of 50 to 100% more. So we see more peptides with DIA, but this is also expected. And as the final step, we analyze our data with in-house software. So we have Spectromine and Spectronaut, which we a little bit specifically because as we discussed earlier, these samples and this spectra that we get are quite peculiar and you need some tweaks to be uh, sure that you analyze things correctly. We did quite some extensive optimization for this enrichment, uh, does not have any digestion. And the, you have the possibility of generating two measurements from one sample because you can first pull down class one HLA and then take the same lysate and pull down class two. So gener effectively generating two samples from one sample. And being such a complicated pipeline, we spent a lot of time optimizing it. So we did more than 33 rounds of optimization by now, and we measured more than 1,000 samples. So we are really confident uh, about our pipeline and how it performs. However, every time you have a new pipeline, you first have to look, is it actually generating the kind of data that I would like? For this, we uh, processed triplicate JY cells. So we use 20 million cells of these JY cells. These are B cells. So they express both class one and class two HLA molecules. We process them in triplicate. And what we can look at is which the number of peptides that are found across all three samples. And we found more than 10,000 peptides. So this is a really large number of peptides and a very high reproducibility. We then, as a second step, we pull down also class two. And also here, the reproducibility is really good. However, a bit lower than for class one, which makes sense because this is a subsequent uh, step. So every step you do in biochemistry, you will increase your noise. Another thing you can do in order to check for the quality is looking at the peptide length distribution. Because as said, especially for class one, we expect peptides to be mostly nine amino acid in length. And some are a bit shorter, a bit longer, but a very sharp peak on nine amino acid in length. So if we plot the fraction on the y-axis of peptides at the different peptide lengths, we find, uh, again, this is the JY data set, a very nice 
peak at nine mers, showing that we are confidently enriching for these peptides here. We can do the same plot for class two and find again uh, the, the picture we would expect. So, a uh, wider distribution in this case served up 15 acid. A nice thing if you use a cell line that you know a lot of and there is sure about is that you can look deeper into the data and check in their quality. A possibility for immunopeptidomics, especially for class one, is looking at the anchor positions. So as discussed, different HLA allotypes bind preferentially specific peptides. And for class one, since the binding cleft is so well defined, it's very conserved. For example, position one and position eight are known to be quite strictly controlled. So what you can do is, for example, for the data set from before with the triplicates, we can look at the fraction of peptides that have each specific amino acid at position number one. And then here I plot the three. So first thing is high reproducibility. The three bars of different colors are very similar. The second thing we notice is the, in position one, we mostly find, find prolines for kind of 50% of the cases. We also find a lot of leucines and isoleucines. So this is the picture. So we have a very strong binding preference. What we can do is go and look in the literature for this cell line for which we know the allotype, what are the kind of peptides that are predicted to bind. And this very much agrees with what we see, again, showing that we generate very nice quality data. We repeated the same for position number eight. And again, uh, enrichment that was expected from the literature. So position A doesn't have a proline as common amino acid, but has in there. Another thing, and something that is very widespread, is the use of prediction algorithms. So you can feed peptide sequences, known allotypes, and ask the algorithm to predict how strongly it will bind to these allotypes. We run this data through uh, one such algorithm, and we found that about 80% of our peptides are predicted as strong binders. So to summarize, the reproducibility of the data is really high. We find the peptide length distribution expected. And in the case, we have the allotype nation. This was the case of Y cells. And this works also better for class one. We can check for the anchor position and predicted binding affinity and come to the conclusion that the quality data is comparable to published data sets in all metrics, uh, which is a, a lot of confidence about uh, our pipeline. We next ask how many cells are actually needed for such a pipeline. Because as I told you, in the literature, there is a lot about how many cells you need. Uh, but since we kind of developed this entire pipeline from scratch, we really asked how sensitive are we? For this, we took again JY cells and we generated a cell ramp from 0 0.1 to 50 million cells. And then the question is, and what is plotted on the y-axis, how many immunopeptides can we see with these different amounts of cells? What we found that we are very sensitive. Already with 5 million cells, we can see uh, more than 7,000 peptides and we find a plateau at 20 million cells. So we have this very nice effect of kind of saturation of signal. We then repeated class two as a follow-up and found a very, very similar picture, but with higher number. This is because class two is known to be more heterogeneous. Next, we asked how much frozen tissue is actually needed because this is really the burning question. And here we ran from 2.5 to 135 milligram for class one, we found we are really, really, really sensitive. So this was healthy lung tissue. Already with 10 milligram, we reached a plateau, more than 10,000 peptides. And uh, then we performed the same for class two. And here we were quite surprised because as you can see, we increase the number of peptides we see with increasing tissue input. And this actually makes sense if we think about the biology, about the heterogeneity of the immune cells you will have in the tissue, as well as the different allotypes and so on and so forth. So this is actually uh, expected.
We then partnered uh, with Indivument in order to look for neoantigens. So what we did here, it's applied our classical pipeline, but complemented it with Indivument abilities in whole sequencing, variant calling, and translated FASTA. So generating expected mutations that we could then query in Spectromine and Spectronaut to look for neoantigens. So neoantigens as a refresher is antigens, so immunopeptides that present a mutation that is unique to the tumor and is not in healthy samples. The first thing when you generate a data set, it's always looking at the quality. So we looked at the peptide length distribution here in gray for class one and in for class two, again, very nice sharp peak and nightmares for HLA class one and a wider one for uh, class two. So what we did is apply this pipeline to the colorectal, to a colorectal cancer cohort. We had 20 samples. Uh, we processed 15 milligram of fresh frozen sample, performed both class one and class two immunopeptidomics. Overall found more than 100,000 immunopeptides and on average, Average 9,700 for class one and 16,000 for class two. What we then looked at is just the number of peptides for both classes. Class one will be then plotted in gray, class two in red across the different samples. And what we found was that while for class one, the variability is relative, uh, relatively low, for class two, the number of peptides we can find in the sample varies a lot. For example, in sample three, we had more than 25,000. And in sample 18, uh, just a couple of hundreds of peptides, immunopeptides identified. And then this again feeds into how cold or hot the different samples were. So how many immune cells they had there. Or... But could we identify new antigens? Yes, we could. For class one, we found 16 new antigens mapping to nine point mutations. So these are single amino acid mutations and to six frame shift mutations. For class two, two we identified 29 neoantigens, 19 point mutations and three frame shifts. And overall, what we then can look at is the number of neoantigens per number of samples. So we have the sample numbers on the X axis, the number of neoantigens identified on the Y axis. And then I highlighted the five samples that are MSI low. So these are samples that have a low mutational bur burden, while the other 15 samples have a high mutational burden. So there you would expect more neoantigens. And then again, using this gray for class one and red for class two, we can look at the number of neoantigens we find across these samples. And what I found very nice is that for almost all MSI high cancer, so 13 out of 15, we have at least one neoantigen. And what was also striking is that only 50, about 50% 50 of these samples had neoantigens for both classes, showing that if you want to increase the likelihood of finding neoantigens, performing both class one and class two immunopeptidomics makes a lot of sense. Next, we looked if this number of neoantigens actually correlates with the mutational burden. So what we plotted is number of neoantigens on the y-axis versus the number of genomic mutations on the x-axis. And what we found is that about one out of thousand mutations on the genomic level make its way all the way out and it's presented by uh, HLA molecules on the cell surface. Showing that it is quite rare events, but uh, it's a considerable number. Now I would like to showcase a very nice example. Uh, and this maps to elongation factor one alpha one. This is a elongation factor as it says. And uh, what's interesting is that it's known to be the autoantigen in 66% of patients with Felty syndrome. So this is an autoimmune disease. And in 66% of these patients, it's known that a immunopeptide or antigen coming from this protein is the one the immune system recognizes. So we can look at the number of immunopeptides that map to this protein that we found across the different samples. So we have the number of immunopeptides on the y-axis and the 20 samples on the x-axis. And then again, in gray, we have class one. In red, we have class two. And what we found was an overwhelming presentation by class two. 
In sample one, we found close to 40 different immunopeptides map mapping to elongation factor one alpha one. And uh, in sample 18, just a couple. Overall, they mostly map to class two. And uh, it seems to be a highly uh, recognized protein. What is interesting is that in sample five, we have an alanine to trionine mutation. So this is a point mutation in one specific amino acid of the sequence. And then the question was, can we actually see this mutation on presented on the HLA molecules? And this was also more interesting because we have 20 peptides that actually mapped this region. So we have a very good resolution of this region. So what we did next was plotting the intensity of the peptides presented across the samples for these about 20 peptides that map to this region. And then we color this peptide in, gray, um, in green if they contain the wild type, so the alanine, and in red if they contain the trionine, so the mutated amino acid, and in gray if they are just next to it, but don't contain any specific information on the amino acid. And what we found was that on most of the samples, we have peptides mapping to the wild type amino acid. And this also in sample number five, which is actually heterogeneous, uh, heterozygous for uh, this specific mutation. But what is very exciting is that we don't find one neoantigen, but we find five different peptides presented by HLA class two molecules there. But being a mass spec company and being mass spec nerds, we always, especially when we look for real things, we really want to look at the raw data and making sure that this is true. So what you can do in Spectronaut is, for example, looking at uh, the wild type to, as a comparison. These we found in fine samples. And what you can do is look at the MS2 XIC. So here you are looking at the co-elution of uh, the fragments generated from this peptide, and it looks very nice. But you can also look at the MS1 isotope envelope. So here you are looking at the distribution of different isotopes present in nature and uh, is expected to generate a distribution at the level of the peptide. And also this one looks very nice. And also you can look at the MS2, so at the fragmentation spectrum. And what we are looking here at is one of the most beautiful fragmentation spectra I've, I've ever seen. So there is almost a complete B, Y on series in blue and uh, one Y ion series. And on the bottom, you also see that all of these fragments are matched with very good accuracy. Then what we can do is go into one sample where we have the new antigen and look at the same features. Since alanine and threonine are very similar physically, except the mass, so they're not active chemically so much, what we would expect, it's very similar pattern, but with the increase in mass. And indeed, we find pr practically the exact same picture, the exact same properties, but at the mass shift range that we would expect for this mutation, so for this amino acid change. So we see everything at 15 m over z higher. So this corresponds to the 30 gram mole increase in mass for this uh, mutation. So we have gener uh, generated a scalable, efficient class one and class two immunopeptidomics pipeline, which generates great quality data. We find class one and class two to be complementary in identifying neoantigens, at, at least in colorectal cancer. And we find more neoantigens mapping to class two. Overall, we could find for almost all cancer that had a high mutational burden, at least one neoantigen. And overall, we could identify uh, more than 40 neoantigens. And this in as little as 20 samples. For what else do we actually use AFA technology and why? Uh, so to conclude, I would like to uh, just give a, you a glimpse about that. So as Nicolas said, reproducibility is key the possibility of having multiple machines that perform the same. The fact that it's scalable, it, we can work with 96 well in the 96 well format. And it doesn't need toxic chemicals. And this is particularly interesting for the FFPE sample processing. What we had beforehand was a very manual, tedious and very toxic process that took a very long time. And what we now have with AFA 
it can we can actually process 96 samples in six, six hours with only 30 minutes of manual pipetting. Also, the sensitivity is really good because we can use as little as five square millimeters of tissue from a 10 micrometer thick slide to generate enough data for our pipelines. And what we get is not just any kind of identification, it's very, very close or even the same as we get for fresh frozen. So from one sample, we can get up, up anything upwards from 9,000 protein group identifications with direct DA, so not even with a library. And as Nicolas already said, what we actually have, uh, we have integrated our Covaris into a larger liquid handling platform. So I ask you, if you want to see this, to click on this video and you will see how uh, this liquid handler goes and uh, pick up the plate, brings it to the Covaris, puts it in, then it takes it out, it dries it because it comes from a water bath that ensures that the temperature is correct throughout the process and then brings it back to, to the liquid handler. And so like this, we can actually automate completely the entire pipeline for FFP sample processing from A to Z so you just put in your samples and then you come back the next day, you have your peptides on a plate that you can put on a mass spec. Uh, and at this point, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm very much looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Nicholas and Marco for your informative presentation. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Marco, it looks like our first question is for you today. And that question is, how much optimization was needed on the Covaris side for the immunopeptidomics pipeline? So that's a great question. Uh, so we find the Covaris device to be very powerful. It also has a lot of settings you can use. And I think it was about 10 rounds of optimization in which we tested different buffers and all different settings you have on the Covaris device. And we found them to be very helpful and uh, you have a lot of flexibility uh, to actually get the quality of the data at the end that you actually want. Great, thank you. Our, our next question looks like it has a few parts to it. So the first part of that question is on the biological side, did you find neopeptides derived from the reoccurrent frame shift mutations in MSIH CRC. Okay, can you repeat the question, especially yeah. the last part? <laughs> yeah, of course. It says, on the biological side, did you find neopeptides derived from reoccurrent frame shift mutations in MSIH CRC? Yeah, yes, not so many, uh, but we did find also our sample size is with 20 samples and uh, five being a uh, low mutational burden. Uh, we didn't have the kind of sample size to really ask these kind of biological questions. It was more a kind of proof of concept. We can see neoepitopes uh, with good uh, sensitivity and this would be the next step to really go into the biology, looking at things that occur multiple times. But we had cases of frame shift mutations that we found on multiple samples and were present in multiple samples. Great, thank you. And the next part of that question is on the technical side, did you also try to use in silico generated fragmentation libraries to increase the number of detectable neopitoids? Did you compare AFA to the commonly used protocol? So we, uh, so this is, a, a, again, a two-side question. So let me start from the bottom, so to say. Uh, so we did not compare uh, our pipeline to uh, a standard uh, protocol. This is just because we developed the protocol, so to say, from scratch and chose the best step uh, along the way. Uh, however, from the numbers, I think it's pretty clear that our pipeline is better than uh, the current pipelines. So I don't see, uh, yeah, the why we should then uh, test that um, as well. And then regarding the first part was about, um, can you refresh my memory? Yes, it says, did you compare AFA to the commonly used protocol? Yes, this is the part I just answered. 
Uh, um, on the technical yeah. side, did you also try to use silico generated fragmentation yes. libraries? Yeah. yeah, that's that's a great question. Uh, we tried a lot of things. We find the classical way of generating libraries being the best, uh, especially considering FDR considerations and the very large search space that you have because of the mutations that you are introducing. Great, thank you. Our next question is, did you generate spectral libraries for the HLA data? If so, how many fractions did you use? Yes, so we did generate a library, uh, and in this case, it was 15 fractions that we used. Great. Our next question asks, how do you separate the peptides from the HLA molecules? Uh, this, uh, you have multiple possibilities. What we do is uh, using a, a classical cleanup uh, step, and then you can choose with your organic solvent. You can then decide what you are eluting there. Great, thank you. Our next question asks, does the amount of sample affect the detection of nanoantigens and immunopeptidome anal analysis, or is it used to release to mutation load? So if you use 15 milli uh, milligram, I think it, it doesn't matter. Uh, the mutational burden will be more significant in uh, affecting the results. While if you, is, is this is especially for class one, of course, for class two, if you increase the amount of sample you process, you will see more peptides. And so you will also likely see more neoantigens. So yes, sample input is uh, a bit limiting. I think less than with other pipelines, but this is uh, one of the great challenges of immunopeptidomics is uh, the samples amount you have. Awesome, thank you. Nicholas, it looks like our next question is for you. Will Kovaris be able to share these protocols? The short answer is no. Uh, I think this is proprietary to uh, Biagnosis. So I've done a lot of optimization. What I can say, and Marco, you will be of course able to comment after that, is that we are of course always keen to support developments. I think that the FFPE workflow that was presented by Marco, we help them optimize at least the first steps, and we can do that for any of our customers. But for that specific workflow here, I think that it would remain a, 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 pro, a property of diagnosis. Marco, do you want to comment? That, that's correct. No, that's, that's everything. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Marco, are you only using Orbitrap instrumentation, or have you also tried a TIMS TOF? So we we have tried, we have tried. Uh, we'll not comment more on that. I, but it it works really well. It's yeah. Great. Our next question asks: Are other fields? What are other fields in which you plan to use Covaris? So we actually plan to to cover all our pipelines, especially now with the integration within the Liquid Angular. Uh, we uh, want to do DNA sharing, uh, and it has a lot of capabilities to really improve uh, the quality of the samples and reproducibility of it. So we are planning to practically do all kinds of licenses with it. Great, thank you. Our next question for you asks, how easy was the implementation in the robot? Ooh, that that was challenging. Uh, of course, every time you do, this is a very large, it's as big as a room, the entire robot, and we have a lot of third party devices. So it took us about maybe six months uh, to get it to work. So uh, it's not as easy, uh, but just because of all the dependencies you have, and you have to think exactly what you want to do and how. Great, thank you. And our next question asks, are you following up on the neoantigen targets? That's a great question. Since it was a collaboration, we really want, were focusing on the technical side while leaving the biology, so to say, to our collaborators. Uh, I know they are uh, liking the result and thinking about how to uh, proceed there. And it looks like we have one more question for today, and that is, how robust is the FFPE protocol? 
we, we found it to be super robust. We are really happy, especially with the low input amount that we can uh, use as well as the different formats. So we found the most challenging part was to put the, the kind of wraps of FFP uh, in the plate, uh, but Kovaris actually also then uh, offered to us this uh, bigger Eppendorf, so to say, or bigger cubes where you could uh, put them in and that was much uh, easier to then uh, do that step as well. Um, and we also find it to be super reproducible, even if you stain the slides, if you de-stain the slides and all of these things. So it's really, really reproducible. Great. Thank you both so much for answering those questions for our audience. Do you have any final comments? I can just step in here uh, just to comment on the last point from, from Marco because we are working on FFP with a lot of uh, customers. And I think that this flexibility between the plate format when you work with lower inputs or with the tube format when you want to, to, to go for a much larger content is also a, a great uh, strength of the Kofaris approach. And we can, of course, uh, help designing other workflows. Uh, Marco mentioned that they are uh, working with cells, with tissues, and there are also other types of samples that uh, can be uh, used with Covaris uh, technology, I would say, outside of this mammalian uh, uh, world. But FFPE, fresh tissue cells, are really uh, our uh, uh, heart of application today. So don't hesitate to come back to us if you have any question also about uh, uh, Marco, you mentioned having tested different buffers, and it's also something we can help with, whether you work with uh, detergent, with uh, urea-based buffer, with uh, non-detergent, at all detergent-free, please ask us and we'll be able to help here. Okay, hey, great. Thank you again, Nicholas and Marco, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Covaris, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we do not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay we encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.